The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. You're welcome to lesson 54 of your distance learning session in advanced level geology with TC Innocent. Our lesson 54, titled River Processes and Features 2, before we examine the content, we will first of all correct the assignment that was given at the end of our previous lesson. At the end of our previous lesson, we were expected to give the factors that determine which river is captured during river capture. The factors that determine which river is captured. Recall during our last lesson, we said river capture is a situation where one river diverts the headwaters of another. So the question is asking to know the condition that will favor one river in order to divert the waters of the other. The response expected, we take into account the erosive powers of the two rivers. The river with a readily erodible course will deviate the headwaters of a river whose bedrocks are resistant to erosion. Secondly, is the nature of the river's course. A river with a straight course to the base level will have higher chances of capturing a river whose course is long and winding. So, these are the aspects you will expect to bring forth as a response. Our lesson 54 is titled River Processes and Features. River Processes and Features 2. And this lesson shall be examined following lesson objectives those changes that we intend to impact on the learner or those changes that we expect to see in the learner at the end of our lesson. We shall look at entry requirement, knowledge the learner should already have in order to better understand our lesson 54, titled River Processes 2. We shall examine the real life situation and carry on with learning activities. At the end of the lesson, we shall have evaluation exercises and assignment. We now look at our lesson objectives. At the end of lesson 54, titled River Processes and Features 2, learners are expected to be able to describe the processes of river transportation and describe the resulting depositional landforms. As objectives, at the end of the lesson, learners should be able to describe the processes through which rivers move their sediments and describe the resulting depositional landforms. We now look at entry requirement. To better understand our lesson 54, Learners are expected to be versed with stages and characteristics of a river. These constitute the materials of our previous lessons. 
during which we observe the three stages of the river's life. Youthful stage where energy level is high and erosion is dominant. Mature stage where energy has dropped and the river involves itself in transportation and deposition. And the old age stage where energy is exhausted and the river involves itself mostly in deposition. We take a light situation. It is a natural phenomenon that every day rivers empty their waters into lakes and oceans. But observations have it that the oceans are never filled, neither are the rivers exhausted. Could it therefore mean that the ocean basins are enlarged as days go by? Or the water emptied by the river is recycled and sent back to its source in or through some processes. We are now going to examine our learning activities, which shall be transportational processes. We shall examine those processes through which a river transports its sediments. We shall look at the resulting depositional features when those sediments are laid down. The landforms that result, we are going to look at their description. We now begin with the first aspect of our lesson, transportational processes. Processes of transportation by river can be solution, by suspension, by saltation, or by traction. River sediments can be transported by solution, suspension, saltation, or traction. We now take each of these processes of transportation and look at what it entails. Solution involves those rocks that are soluble. Their components are dissolved and transported by the river in the form of ions. In this method of transportation, we do not see physical sediments, but the rock is carried in ionic form. This process is common with rocks that are soluble, such as limestone, especially when there is weak acid available, and the evaporite deposits. These are rocks that can easily have their components transported by solution. We now examine the process of suspension. Suspension as a process of river transportation involves very small particles of seals and clay sites. And in this process, these particles, because of their small sizes, are carried aloft in suspension without any contact with the river's bed. So, suspension involves sediments that are small in size and that are carried permanently in suspension without touching the floor of the river or the bed of the river. The sediments are carried aloft. Saltation, derived from the Latin word salted, implying to jump. It is a transportation process that involves a series of leaves and drops of particles, ranging from sand size particles to table size. When water current builds pressure behind these particles, the particles are given energy and are projected in suspension. Once the suspension, the energy reduces and the particle bounces back to the river bed. This process of transportation, where sediments are given a series of leaves and drops, constitute transportation by saltation. Traction. Here the materials are rolled in permanent contact with the river's bed. This process of transportation, especially by rolling, constitute one of those processes that erode the river's bed through abrasion. 
Loads that are transported by fraction are loads that carry on the highest abrasive effects on the rivers, beds, and banks. So traction involves those particles that are larger enough. Those particles whose weights not permit them to be transported in suspension or by saltation. We now look at a general diagram summarizing the four types of transportations described above. Here we have solution, implying the components are in the ionic form. That is why there we have nothing like particles shown. Away from solution, we have also made mention of suspension. These are particles that are in suspension. Here is the direction of river movement. Here is the river's bed. So these particles are particles that are carried in suspension. Here we have salvation. These are particles that are given a series of leaves and drops. Some of them you can see in suspension while others are already on the river bed. And finally, the larger blocks of rocks here are moved by only in close contact with the river's bed through the process of traction. We now continue deposition. It is a process that involves the laying down of those particles whose movement we have just described. Deposition takes place when the river's velocity reduces. This reduction in velocity can come as a result of reduction in gradient or as a result of friction towards the banks and nearer the river bed. When velocity reduces, these sediments are laid down in various ways to produce different landforms. We now take on those landforms that result from the position. As the positional landforms, we examine meanders, oxbow lakes, floodplains, levees, braided channels, alluvial fans, and deltas. These are the landforms that we are going to examine. We take on meanders. When we examined the stages of a river's life, we said at the old age stage, because the energy of the river has reduced considerably, the river looks for a path that has the least resistance. And in that situation, the river begins to move in a winding manner. This winding manner, this snake-like movement of the river, constitute what we call meanders. The, the outward banks of the river experiences high degree of erosion while sediments are laid down at the inner bank of the meander. Such that if I have two meanders that are adjacent as seen here, erosion will be eaten up this outward bank and this other outward bank while the position will be taking place at these inner banks of the meander. Oxbow lakes. Oxbow lakes evolved from meanders. They result from the modifications of meanders through the process of erosion. We take a situation. Here we have a meander. The arrows show the direction of movement of the river. Erosion is higher at this outward bank and also higher at this outward bank. So implying that the gap separating the river from these two banks will reduce as erosion proceeds so that at situation B, we have the gap reduced. As time moves on, erosion on this outer side persists and the gap continues to narrow until a situation arises when the river, instead of following the normal meandering path winding behind, this piece of land, the river cuts direct to give us this situation here. When the river now begins to pass direct and no longer meanders, sediments will be laid down at the entrance of the body of water that has been isolated so that the situation becomes this. 
these sediments now laid down will cut off this horseshoe shaped structure called Oxbow Lake. This body of water is now cut off from the remaining river. If this water dries off, then a fossilized meander will result. We now examine floodplains. Floodplains are those areas beside the river that receive its excess water during flood. When the river overflows its banks, the excess water moves in this area that surrounds the river. This water, because its velocity drops rapidly, lays down fine sediments that are silty and clay, making these areas around the river very fertile areas for farmland. A river's floodplain, the extent of a river's floodplain, depends on how the river meanders and how the meanders also migrate. It also depends on the discharge of the river. Rivers with high discharge. During flood periods, their excess water are also high, so can occupy a larger area of the land that surrounds the river. So, flood means are those adjacent body of land around the river that receives the river excess water during flood. Levees. Levees are banks of sediment deposited at the edge of the river's bank. A bed of sediment that is deposited at the edge of the river's bank. On this animation, the two arrows are pointing towards a levee. How is a levee formed? During flood periods, the excess water that leaves the river's channel has sediments present. These sediments are both coarser sediments and finer sediments. When the water finally leaves the river's channel, the coarser sediments will not be moved far because of their sizes and their weights. They accumulate at the leaves of the river's bank while the final ones are carried to the floor plane. A repetition of this process will build a narrow bank of coarser sediments that tends to extend the river's bank upward. Such features are temporal because subsequent flooding can break through the banks. We now examined braided channels. In our previous lesson, we said a braided channel develops when the river's capacity or the river's load is more than the water would carry. So the river now lays down some of its load, and within a main channel, numerous smaller channels develop. Each channel separated from the other by a small temporal island called a yacht. When subsequent high discharge periods come, such islands can be submerged. Alluvial fans. Rivers that take their rise from mountain areas and descend to a new land. When they gather their sediments from the mountainous areas, the gradient gives them energy to transport those sediments. But when they reach the lowland areas, their energy dissipates very fast and they are sediments. They can no longer transport it. They lay down the sediment and they form a series of smaller channels within the sediment. This loop shaped structure, as resulting from the action of the river, is what we refer to as alluvial fans. We now examined deltas. Deltas are mostly formed at the entrance of a river into the ocean. When the river enters the ocean, its velocity drops rapidly to zero, and then all the sediments that the river is carrying is laid down. For the sediments that constitute a delta to be preserved, the environment should be calm, implying the energy level of the environment should be reduced. So when these sediments are laid down, they constitute deltas. Deltas are very fertile areas of petroleum search. They are areas where petroleum deposits are common because of the rich organic nature of these sediments that are laid down. We are now going to look at structure of a delta. A delta sediment is characterized by three cells. 
The top set sediments, which are usually horizontal and show no dip. The four set sediment that is directly below the top set and above the bottom set that shows a degree of inclination and extends seaward more than the top set. And finally, the bottom set sediment, which is further in to the sea. So, this is a structure of a normal delta. We now examine types of deltas. We start with the aqueous deltas with their triangular structures. A common one is that of the Nile River. The word delta was supposed to point from the Latin word delta, which has the Latin letter delta, which has a triangular shape. So, aqueous deltas are those that are formed under conditions where directions of river wave and sea waves are varied to give the delta its triangular shape. The next form of deltas, cosmic deltas, are deltas that are V-shaped. These are deltas that are common in areas where the activity of the ocean is greater than that of the river. We take the example of the Abel Delta in Spain. Finally, we look at bird's foot delta, just as the name bird's foot. It has the appearance of the feet of birds. This type of data, for example, that of Mississippi, is a data in which the river's energy, the, the hydrodynamic condition of the river is more powerful than that of the ocean so that the delta extends deeper into the ocean. Such deltas are rare because rare are those rivers whose energy, hydrodynamic situation, are more than that of the sea. So an example of such burnt foot delta is the Mississippi Delta. As we recall, rivers transform their loads in solution as suspension, saltation, and traction, depending on the solubility and the sizes of the samples. Those that are soluble will be transported through solution, and the rest will be transported in any of the processes depending on their sizes. When river velocities drop, the sediments that are carried by the rivers are laid down. These sediments are laid down in several ways, in different styles, to produce different depositional landforms, which are the Oxbow Lakes, Levis, Floodplains, Alluvial Farms, Deltas, or Meanders. We now take on some evaluation exercises. We take exercise one. Which method of transportation will cause the highest abrasion of stream bed? Which method of transportation will cause the highest abrasion of stream bed? A, solution. B, salvation. C, suspension, and D, traction. Our correct answer is D, traction. Traction is a method of transportation in which the sediment is in close contact with the river's bed, moved either by rolling or by pulling under the force of the river's motion. So our correct answer for exercise one is traction. Traction will carry on the highest abrasion of the river's bed and banks. Exercise two. Saltation as transportation process involves A. Coating sediments with salt. B. Moving sediments in suspension. C. Moving sediments in a series of leaves and drops. D rolling the sediments on salt deposits.
Our correct answer here is C. Saltation, we said, is derived from the Latin word salte, implying to jump. So during saltation, sediments are given a series of leaves and drop as a toad will move. Exercise 3. Which depositional feature is formed by the modification of a meander? A. Oxbow Lakes. B. Levis. C. Floodplains. D. Deltas. Which of these features is formed by a modification of a meander? Our correct answer is A. Recall that Oxbow Lakes develop when a meander is cut off and the mouth of the meander sealed with sediments to isolate the body of what are called an oxbow lake. Exercise 4. When river current is stronger than the sea waves, A. Cosplay deltas develop. B. Birds food deltas develop. C. Aqua deltas develop and D. River deltas develop. When river current is stronger than sea current, our correct answer here is B. Birds food deltas develop. And we have said such deltas have the tendency of extending for a longer distance seaward since a hydrodynamic condition of the river is powerful. Exercise 5. Which example of delta is shown on the image beside? A. Aqua delta. B. Cospe delta. C. Birdsfoot delta. D. Marine delta. Our correct answer here is A. Aqua delta those deltas that have a triangular shape. As assignment, how are alluvial fans formed? As your assignment, you find out how alluvial fans are formed. This brings us to the end of our lesson 54, titled River Processes and Features 2. Our next lesson, shall be on drainage patterns and stream ordering. See you in our next lesson. Una tege si, ma tege yop. Una tege minga, ma tege nyum. Una tege majang, ma tege ndom. Ma ne tambia ninya ne injubya yen. Ngani bana, ma tege mot. Ngani la kiri, wa tege ndong. Esa kina, bia jinki do. Ma ne tambia ninya ne injubya yen. Tam tama mote, tam zabike. Tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambia ninya ne injubya yen